Hello and welcome. The British Columbia Council for International Cooperation is excited to launch its latest publication, British Columbians' Perspectives and Engagement on Global Issues in Light of COVID-19, and to have the lead writer and researcher join us today to share some of the key highlights and findings from the report. For those of you who don't know us, BCCIC is a member-based organization consisting of international development organizations and individuals working towards sustainable global development. Our work takes place on their traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And we pay our profound respect for the hosts of this land for their stewardship since time in the memorial. The report and its companion presentation, which you're about to watch, is intended to provide insight into the views of British Columbians not usually engaged with global cooperation, as well as practices for engaging these groups and enhancing global citizenship more broadly. We encourage you to read the full report after listening to this presentation, which you can find linked below in the description or on our website, bccic.ca. It is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Kaylee Higgs. They're the former SDG research assistant at BCCIC and lead writer of the research report you'll learn more about in just a few seconds. Kaylee's experiences have included working in small scale agriculture, coordinating environmental justice initiatives, contributing to a right to food sign, teaching introductory data analysis, and facilitating learner centered education. She holds an Associate of Arts in Global Stewardship and a Bachelor of Science in Global Resource Systems, where she focused her learning around environmental justice, food systems, decolonization, and storytelling. Most recently, Kaylee completed a Master's of Philosophy in Anthropocene Studies, where they questioned apocalyptic and colonial narratives and focused their research on local encounters and connections with large-scale issues, especially everyday connections with the Anthropocenes on local urban farms. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Kaylee. Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Kaylee and today I'll be sharing a summary of a 2022 research project and report by the British Columbia Council for International Cooperation or BCCIC on British Columbian perspectives on global issues in, in light of COVID-19. I recently completed a work placement with the BCCIC as their Sustainable Development Goals Research Assistant where I supported with uh, analyzing and writing this report. Uh, I'm excited to share it with you. In this presentation, I'll start by situating and introducing the BCCIC uh, and addressing the research project and its origins. I then plan to get into more of a project overview, um, covering some of the methods, um, and then get into the research findings and applications. Um, at the end, I'll also share some details on where I find the complete report, um, which is also where the citations are for this presentation, as well as other work by the BCCIC. So to start, I would like to recognize that while we may be engaging in a virtual space at the moment, all of this work is situated, and we are all in networks of relationships uh, to people, places, systems. Uh, the BCCIC is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, um, and I am currently also residing on the homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Indigenous peoples have lived here since time immemorial and continue to sustain their governance and legal systems, cultures, homelands, and languages in the face of attempted genocide and ongoing colonization. Colonial and imperial forces had led to innumerable injustices locally and around the world historically and currently. As a white settler in this place, I am continuing to learn and unlearn how the position of settlers carries with it certain relationships and responsibilities and what this might mean in my daily life. Um, so as we come together in this space, I'd like to invite a moment to reflect on where you are, uh, the stories and lineages that led you to this time and place, um, and the relationships and responsibilities um, enmeshed with this. Um, and if you don't know the nation whose homelands you are on, uh, I encourage you to learn more and look it up now or after this presentation, um, nativeland.ca is a good starting point. Um, so these relationships to land and place um, is always important um, and may be especially important to recognize and consider in the context of this presentation as well as Indigenous peoples' leadership and well-being 
um, and decolonization more broadly is an essential part of a just and sustainable world um, thing that the BCCIC strives for. So BCCIC's vision is that British Columbians are engaged in global cooperation for a just, equitable, and sustainable world, whereas its mission is um, to engage its members and others to share knowledge, build relationships, and develop capacity towards achieving global sustainable development. Um, so the BCCIC is a network of member organizations and individuals with connections to British Columbia um, that engage in global cooperation, social justice, and environmental sustainability. This network provides a hub for learning and growing together, um, and the BCCIC strives to support its members in working for social justice, uh, connecting voices, um, and practicing unlearning and relearning around international cooperation. As a member-driven uh, organization with links around the world, BCCIC felt the shifts in 2020, uh, like everyone. Um, so of course, that was the start of the global COVID-19 pandemic. And with that taking off and shifting ways of being together and relating on local and international scales, uh, BCCIC members noted the exacerbated inequalities and challenges associated with taking action during a pandemic. Some authors and organizations also noted the possibility for the immense changes taking place to be a starting point to choose not to go back to the so-called normal systems that were doing so much harm. So with this in mind and in consultation with its members, BCCIC shifted to a virtual campaign and related research initiative. So responding to the pandemic included multiple facets for the BCCIC. Of particular note to this project, the BCCIC ran a virtual campaign called Responding to the Pandemic, Stories of Creativity, Resilience, and Leadership, in which the BCCIC reached out to its member organizations um, and ended up featuring a number of partners internationally as well as locally to share short videos from people around the world um, who were responding to the challenges presented by COVID. These videos reached thousands and prompted questions around their impact, how British Columbians were perceiving international cooperation in the midst of a global pandemic, and how to support global citizenship while nationalism and xenophobia were high. Um, and global citizenship here can broadly be defined as a global community mindedness and responsibility that informs one's understanding of their positionality uh, and inspires action for collaboration with others for justice and peace. The BCCIC decided to take action on this um, and conduct research to better understand the shifting perspectives of British Columbians at this time uh, and how to support global citizenship with the intention that this could prompt reflection and inform current and future work in the face of system shocks such as COVID. The research that then stemmed from this uh, is what's covered in this presentation uh, as well as the report. So in the rest of this presentation, I'll be sharing the process, findings, and potential applications of this research. So the research itself included multiple elements, uh, some primary research that included focus groups and surveys. Now, this primary research was targeted um, with a group that is least engaged by the BCCIC and its members, especially those who hold a Canada first attitude towards international assistance in contrast with a more globally minded and representative group, as well as uh, men. The data that were collected in the primary research were then analyzed uh, using some quantitative methods, such as chi-squares to test for independence, um, and then primarily qualitative analysis, looking for themes that emerged within the focus groups especially. This was then synthesized, and secondary research was also done to relate some of the findings into a broader network of knowledge and understanding, uh, especially recognizing the smaller and more qualitative nature of this research.
In that regard, it's important to note that there are a number of ethical and limitational considerations with this research, as with any. In particular, it is quite focused on a specific target group and region, the region, of course, being British Columbia, and the target groups, uh, especially, being, as I mentioned, a Canada First group and a more globally minded group in comparison, um, as well as uh, especially men over the age of 35 who identified as non-racialized. The sample size was also relatively small and focused, so this really provides a snapshot of this time and place. Participants were compensated and all of the focus groups and surveys were done online. The recruitment process was also uh, voluntary for the surveys, um, which potentially could lead to people having stronger opinions one way or another because they chose to, to take the time to do this survey and then through a recruitment agency for the focus groups. Um, this research did have quite a broad, wide breadth, so the depth on certain topics maybe wasn't a de as deep, but it did discuss quite a range of topics. And um, as always, this knowledge is not coming happening in a vacuum, um, and it's important to recognize that there could be potential gaps or other unforeseen considerations with this based on uh, my own positionality and the positionality of the other researchers and writers who contributed to this project. Still, based on the research and data overall, we were able to draw out some big themes and potential applications for this to work such as the BCCIC and its members do. And so in this following section, I'm going to share some of that. Um, and I've broken it down into four big themes with some of the key findings and recommendations underneath each. Um, so there are 10 recommendations overall based on this information with a series of findings relating to each topic. So let's begin. Um, the first big recommendation or idea is to feature storytelling. So in our primary research, we found that participants connected most to clear storytelling and personal narratives based on the videos they watched. They also expressed a desire for hopeful or fun messaging, especially during the pandemic. Um, multiple participants mentioned that they felt uh, overwhelmed with the amount of negative um, messaging going on. Um, and then also a desire for database narratives were appreciated. Um, this was similarly supported by secondary research. Um, storytelling in general has been noted as a powerful form of communication. And uh, hopeful messaging also aligns with an asset-based approach um, and maybe especially important for skeptics. So potential actions based on these findings would be to center storytelling and personal narratives. Uh, personal narratives were the ones that participants noted as being most relatable to them or things that stood out to them. The second recommendation would be to highlight stories that are hopeful. Participants didn't want things sugarcoated entirely, but they did want some sense that there's a possibility for change or a hope for something else to be the case um, for them to feel like it was worth um, engaging with more. Um, and then third, to communicate narratives with evidence um, wherever possible, um, even if this is through story or just relaying how the clear impacts or implications of an action, um, participants really wanted to know that and what the evidence and links were with that. So the second big theme um, coming out of the research is to facilitate links and actions. So this links to a few different findings in our research. Uh, we found um, participants had a desire for there to be easy, actionable things for them to do or learn more or get involved when it came to uh, international cooperation or these um, conversations with local and global initiatives for social justice. And relatedly, they also wanted personal, global and small action to large goal links to be clear. Um, so for some participants, that meant understanding how they connected with 
these issues going on either internationally or even locally, as well as um, some talked about specifically how big goals is dealing with climate change, for instance, often felt so intangible to them that they didn't understand how to get involved or even that felt like there was a point, whereas much smaller action or more narrowly focused actions were very clear to them. So um, this is an invitation to uh, make those links really clear how uh, divesting, divesting at a university, for instance, contributes to climate justice overall, even though it seems like a small, uh, narrowly focused goal. Relatedly, um, participants expressed that they were more likely to support or engage with uh, tangible, clear, specified um, actions that were very well defined. And then also there was interest expressed in a div diverse ways of engaging with these topics. So um, some participants felt like with um, international or global issues especially, uh, the only way to engage was through donations or maybe somewhat through politics. Um, and who they voted for or petitions, perhaps. So a lot of them felt at a loss of how to engage and as a result, disengaged. So there was definitely an interest expressed in learning how to have multiple channels for engagement with an organization. So even if they didn't have the means to donate, for instance, they could learn more or connect in other forms. Some similar links were found in our secondary research. So um, a recent study suggested that Canadians in general um, are more supportive of specific initiatives such as um, emergency or crisis relief uh, rather than overall kind of international assistance. Um, having, having multiple means of engagement increases accessibility. Um, this is something studied in various learning um, platforms. And um, clear, a clear theory of change or how those smaller actions add up to uh, larger actions or larger goals can be important and has been noted as such in various social organizing or movements. So based on these findings in the primary and secondary um, follow-up research, there are two main actions to add to our previous three. So um, providing diverse and clear channels for engagement so people can jump um, right in or even if that's to learn more or whatever your goal, goal is um, with it really. And two, to make it clear how tangible impacts add up to more abstract goals. So um, how those very direct um, and small scale things that people feel like they have some control over or can engage with, uh, like attending a rally or signing a petition um, or making a donation um, or learning more or whatever form that might take um, can add up into a more abstract goal such as um, yeah, addressing climate change or ending poverty worldwide or whatever else it may be. So our third big um, theme that um, had a lot of things come up with it um, is around addressing skepticism. Um, and this even relates somewhat to some of the previous points made around um, making some uh, impacts in such clear and stories uh, data driven. So uh, in terms of pri findings in our primary research, this emerged as a major theme in focus groups. It was discussed in pretty much every focus group in some form, in particular distrust around NGO transparency and potential corruption, um, as well as misinformation and bias within media. There was a lot of concern expressed um, about uh, various organizations, as well as media sources around who you could trust, what you could trust, um, that there was corruption. Um, this also came up in relation to governments. However, the relationship with the government was a little bit more mixed with there being dis a mix of distrust and also recognition of it having potential for, for positive change as well. Uh, this was also aligned with secondary research that there is growing skepticism. Um, a seven-year uh, trust gauge in Canada is at an on all-time low as of 2021. Another recent report suggests that most Canadians do not think that international aid gets to those who need it the most. And there, this aligns as well with an increasing amount of misinformation. A recent study out of Oxford suggested that uh, over 80 countries 
worldwide have misinformation going on um, and that this is increasing and that that governments in at least 48 countries are using private firms to facilitate so-called manipulation campaigns to spread dis and misinformation. So while this may seem somewhat tangential to uh, addressing, uh, addressing skepticism, it seems important to note that there is perhaps a reason for this that is linked to um, not only ideological beliefs um, and our current state of politics and media, but also linked to um, trends in the way that information is being shared, not only with, on social media networks, but also within government and uh, more mainstream media channels. So some potential actions specifically aimed at addressing this um, would be one, to build relationships, trust, and rapport. So relationships are so important on many, many levels. And considering your organizational practices, communication strategies, accountability, and relational practices, um, and how this might support, yeah, having meaningful relationships and trusting relationships as well could be important for this. Um, and then second, considering your project goals and focusing your energy strategically. This is partially around considering what the goals are of engagement or of an, a global citizenship initiative um, and reflecting on who should be and or could be engaged with this. So the amount of energy taken to engage with someone who is very skeptical and doesn't feel much hope at all about international assistance or doesn't believe in mainstream media and isn't sure how to relate to or what to trust um, internationally. Um, that came up quite a bit around how do people get their information and is it trustworthy? Um, as if someone's not in a place, a lot of people found it hard to assess what's really going on, especially if they didn't, they didn't feel trusting of the news sources. So Engaging with someone who has this hesitation already versus someone who is much more open to engaging with these topics and trusts, uh, has a bit more trust in mainstream media or has maybe personal connections with what's happening internationally and feels like they have a good sense of what's going on is going to be a very different conversation to have and require different levels of energy to potentially, uh, to potentially engage in a good faith way. There are some interesting resources around this as well that talk about it, such as the Spectrum of Allies, um, and that's all to within the report as well. So the final big theme is around considering the audience. So the primary findings for this largely came out of reflections in the focus groups on the importance of targeting an audience and how media is used differently within different groups. Um, this was especially noted across generations. Um, this also links to some findings in the survey where there were uh, links found between people who, who see Canada as having a responsibility to provide international assistance and people who support increasing international assistance, for instance, or between people who see international assistance as effective um, and those who support it as, as well. Um, we also found that um, it seemed that existing interests supported engagement. So one of the main um, points of connections that people had was if they had visited a place before or had family there or an existing interest in the region. In the secondary research, there were some somewhat similar or complementary findings, including that targeting audiences can be a very effective communication style according to a lot of marketing and branding experts um, and that beliefs on root issues may affect support so this was in a recent presentation with the intercouncil network um, where on some recent research that suggested that um, someone's view on the root cause of poverty for instance um, impacts how supportive they are of uh, aid spending so in that example Canadians that um, understood the causes of poverty to be linked to global exploitation or lack of access were more supportive of aid spending than those who understood it as 
because of corruption or blaming governments or the circumstances of those in poverty themselves. The secondary research also suggested that certain media outlets are more popular um, amongst Canadians. Um, Different demographics use different media. Um, So for instance, uh, TikTok is much more popular among people under uh, 25 um, than those over 50. And the resources and citations containing all um, more detailed information on this can also be found in the report. So the final three potential actions um, from this would be to, one, address existing knowledge and connection in messaging angles. So this might be working to ensure that language is accessible. Um, Amidst our participants, there was a wide variety of language used, and some even mentioned that um, certain countries, they didn't feel like they knew anything of what was going on, so they needed more context um, to really understand the details of a story or situation. Um, This also relates to finding um, and striving to connect with um, what people already have a relationship with, whether that be interests um, or personal connections of some other form. Somewhat relatedly is to consider belief linkages and current concerns. So this is again thinking about an intended audience and working to convey information through uh, messaging angles that align with their interests um, or potentially linked beliefs uh, and current concerns. And finally, um, use a tailored approach to media platforms and applications. So this also relates to considering the target audience and how different platforms might reach or impact or affect them um, and using media platforms and outlets accordingly. So in the example before, um, if you're trying to reach people over 50, um, you probably don't want to use TikTok as your primary form of connecting. So that concludes the summary of the research and the 10 main findings from it um, under those four main uh, headings of considering the audience, addressing skepticism, facilitating links and actions, and featuring storytelling. So more information on the report and full details on the findings, the recommendations, the primary and secondary research um, methods and everything else, um, as well as a list of resources um, to continue to explore some of these potential applications and hopefully enact them can be found on the BCCIC website at www.bccic.ca. And there is also an executive summary that has written the 10 main suggestions, as well as these broader findings. So to wrap up, um, we want to recognize that this has been a collective effort with support from a lot of different people and organizations, um, in particular, Cannoli Foundation and Global Affairs Canada, as well as Career Launcher. And full acknowledgements can be seen in the report and on this page here. Thank you to all the artists and photographers who contributed their works to uh, the Creative Commons and that could be used in this presentation. And finally, thank you for listening. We hope this was useful information. Uh, Please reach out if you have any questions or would like to learn more from our website. Otherwise, uh, thank you again for your time and attention. And I hope it was an interesting and useful piece to listen to. Thank you.